Well, I said prior to the lecture that uh, Craig, like the LSE that he leads, has broad, wide perspectives and uh, thinks of uh, issues across different subject boundaries. So I think uh, you'll appreciate that we have been given a presentation which is uh, wide-ranging and truly uh, global in its reach. Who better to respond uh, to this kind of presentation uh, than Nikos Muzelis, Emeritus uh, Professor of Sociology at the London School of Economics. And uh, we're going to invite Nikos to um, pursue some of the points that Craig has raised. After Nikos has spoken, I'm going to open it up. Perhaps we can uh, put the lights up and invite comments and questions from the audience. Before we do so, Nico. Uh, well, I want to thank very much Professor Calhoun for a very, very uh, wide-ranging, lucid, and very penetrating analysis of what happens today in the world. Uh, my small paper or presentation uh, will be much more limited uh, what I have done is to pick up uh, three themes from Professor Calhoun's uh, very impressive world uh, and just make some comments on them. The first is on social movements. The second is the European project. And the third is the future of capitalism. Uh, so about social movements, we've heard enough. I'm not sure I agree with the way uh, it has been conceptualized by Professor Calhoun. I have a much more uh, limited uh, conception, but uh, uh, I will just say a few things about the recent social movements. There is no doubt that most recent social movements has as a common background the rise of neoliberal globalization in the 70s and the subsequent world economic crisis that is still with us. Now, if neoliberalism, the world economic crisis, is what underlies the ongoing mobilizations. These movements take different forms according to the specific context within which they have appeared. For instance, social movements in Southern Europe are quite different from the so-called Arab Spring movements. In the Arab case, we see a marked difference between secular democratically oriented movements fighting autocracy and on religious movements, the latter being less interested in democratization and more in the Islamization of state and society. Uh, this clash between the secular and the religious often leads, as in Egypt, to new forms of autocracy. On the other hand, concerning Southern Europe, which will be my focus, the Sidagma Square type of movements can be seen as a continuation of the more global mobilizations of the Seattle and Genova type. They are mainly against the neoliberal strategy imposed by Germany, the dominant economic power in the European Union. This strategy imposes austerity, balanced budgets, and in the case of Southern Europe, a shock therapy as far as institutional reforms are concerned. Now, such measures resulted in huge inequalities, unprecedented levels of unemployment, particularly among the young, and more general the peripheralization, if not pauperization, 
of a large section of the population. Moreover, the German insistence on austerity rather than development at the time of severe economic recession made impossible the reduction of the huge national debt, particularly in Greece. Now, those reacting actively to this difficult situation, apart from trade unions, were mainly unemployed people, as well as those who had precarious, badly paid jobs. In the Sidagma Square, there were voices against the corrupt party system, even voices from the radical left and extreme right against the, the democratic parliamentary system. And of course, there were also young people who, as it is already mentioned, they were anti-politics uh, altogether. But the majority, I think, was protesting against the harsh neoliberal measures which abolished basic social rights and brought about the shrinking of the welfare state. Uh, what they wanted, basically, was a passage from the neoliberal to the more humane social democratic capitalism of the early post-war period. But as in the Seattle type of mobilizations, the present social movements, with few exceptions, failed to take strong roots. For a variety of reasons, they had an ephemeral, fragile character. They fa failed to offer an alternative solution to the crisis. They had, therefore, no great impact on the rapidly deteriorating situation. On the other hand, extreme right-wing movements and parties in Greece and elsewhere are growing fast, as is well known. The xenophobic, europhobic, anti-democratic discourses and practices undermine seriously the very foundations of the European project. More generally, looking at the social picture as a whole, the decline of European trade unionism, the fragile character of social movements, and the rise of the anti-European extreme right makes the prospect of European unification highly problematic. Moving now from the present disappointing situation in Europe, what are the possible future developments? Given that globalization entails not the shrinking of the state, but the reduction of its autonomy, it is obvious that social democracy of the early post-war type, uh, which through state intervention managed to expand political and social rights to the popular classes, is not anymore possible at least as far as Southern Europe is concerned, a progressive social democracy is not anymore possible within one country. It can only be achieved on a post-national, transnational level. It can only be achieved within a broader framework like the Eurozone, which has some autonomy vis-à-vis -vis the global social order. Of course, this presupposes that the Eurozone changes its present architecture. It presupposes a decisive shift from the neoliberal, German-dominated Europe to a social democratic community of countries which is based on solidarity and which realizes that its survival depends on redistributive mechanisms from the economically more competitive to the less competitive economies of the Eurozone. If this does not happen, we will continue to have what one can call an unequal exchange. That is to say, 
a transfer of resources, structural transfer of resources from the less competitive to the more competitive economies. Transfer of resources which is much bigger than the aid that Southern Europe receives from the North. Uh, in fact, what we have now is on the level of a nation state, just imagine a nation state with developed markets uh, where there are no distributive mechanisms and you have a single currency, the same currency, uh, where you have no welfare state at all. Automatically, what happens is that uh, inequalities increase and that the rich get richer and the poor poorer. Uh, now, the point is, is a Europe based on solidarity possible? I think that it is difficult, but possible. If not the voters, the German elites realize that it is in the long-term interest of their country to maintain the Union. For destroying it, given the rising new economies, Germany will become a third-class player in the global economic and geopolitical arena. For the moment, Merkel wants something impossible, to maintain the Eurozone's neoliberal character and at the same time ensure its long-term survival. However, one cannot achieve both. Therefore, I believe that Germany will soon have to choose either a social democratic transformation of the Eurozone or its dissolution. Moving finally for, from the European to the global level, many observers, given the decline of mass labor organizations, trade unions, and fragile social movements, are pessimistic about changes coming from below. However, despite this, some of them believe that the capitalist system will soon collapse because of its systemic internal contradictions. According to this view, given the unprecedented global concentration of wealth in a few hands, and the fact that this wealth is mainly directed to the financial sphere, rather than to more productive sectors, sooner or later we will see the imminent death of the capitalist system. This theory has, of course, a long history, particularly in the Marxist literature. But it is revived today by scholars who believe that the present crisis will create conditions leading to a capitalist collapse, even without serious popular pressure from below. As far as I'm concerned, contrary to the above, I believe that the end of capitalism is not around the corner. Certainly, capitalism is not an unavoidable permanent feature of modern complex societies. But most probably, it will be with us for a rather long time. Capitalism has survived many serious crises in the past, and it is probable that the system will survive in the years to come. My argument for this is based on the view that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, in the global economic system, one can ideal typically identify three types of capitalism. 
First, the neoliberal type, whose dominant actor remains the United States. Second, the rapidly ascending authoritarian capitalism of China. And third, the weaker, semi-social democratic or socio-liberal, as some call it, type of Western European capitalism, which has a long history of popular social reforms and which might in the future, if the Eurozone survives as an economically, politically and socially integrated formation, might become a serious force of progressive social transformation. For the moment, there are only two hegemons, two serious global players in the economic arena, the United States and China. The United States remains the leading economic power in the world. Its technological advances, the quality of its research institutes, and the dynamism of its workforce place the country on the top. China, on the other hand, with impressive rapid growth and the size of its economy, has become the other dominant global power. Of course, for the moment, the suppression of civil and political rights has created a very negative image of China in the West. But on the other hand, its rapid economic growth creates a large middle class which, as in South Korea and Taiwan, may lead to the gradual opening of its political system. Moreover, China has achieved a unique social transformation. Despite its huge inequalities in the urban centers, it managed to get out of absolute poverty almost half a billion people, half a billion human beings, which is unprecedented. That means that for the first time in Chinese history, during bad harvests, peasants do not face starvation, an extraordinary feat which we do, must, most of us do not know. And particularly left-wing people, they don't want to mention it. Finally, as far as the Eurozone is concerned, if it avoids collapse, might become the third major economic player. If that happens, we will pass from the G2 to the G3. The G3 have, of course, diver divergent interests. But increasingly, as nation states are becoming more and more interrelated, their common interests will become stronger than their conflicting ones. And this because there are several problems which, if not dealt with globally and cooperatively, will hurt all three. Problems like climate change and global environmental destruction, the lack of effective control of atomic energy, the expanding global networks of terrorists, drug dealers, traffickers of human beings, etc. But above all, all three global capitalist superpowers have a common interest in, regulated the, in regulating the world economy in ways that future economic crises will be more easily and effectively managed. Now, such possible developments may not lead to further democratization. This is highly problematic. But it may lead to the weakening of the present dictatorship of unregulated, or badly regulated markets. Thank you.